Hello and welcome everyone to today's book talk. Um, my name is Nadia Ali and I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our event series today. Uh, this is for the coming academic year. Um, we have a lot planned, um, including a lecture series on querying the Middle East. I hope that you'll have a chance to look at our program on the website or get yourself on our mailing list. But today I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our speaker today. Um, Haga Kotev is a senior lecturer in political theory and comparative political thought at the Department of Politics at SOAS University of London. Welcome Haga. Uh, we did actually overlap for a few years. Uh, we just realized between 2014 and 2019 at SOAS. Her research interests are political theory, Israel-Palestine, settler colonialism, feminist theory, and liberalism and its critiques, specifically post-structuralist and post-colonial. Her previous book, Movement and the Ordering of Freedom, which was published by Duke University Press in 2015, charts the conceptual history of mobility and immobility in the history of political thought and structuring of political spaces from the writings of Locker, Hobbes and Mill to the sophisticated technologies of control that circumscribe the lives of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. Today, however, we'll be discussing her most recent book, The Colonizing Self or Home and homelessness in Israel-Palestine. As you will find out, the book examines the construction of political belonging in settler colonies. It investigates how people develop, develop attachment to space, not despite violence or by denying it, but rather, as Haga argues, through violence. And uh, the book was published recently by Duke University Press. So Haga and I, will be in conversation for about 40 minutes or so, and then we have some time for discussion. And if you have any questions or comments, you can um, put those in the Q&A function on the webinar. So welcome, Haga. It's really nice to have you here. Um, so I read your book uh, quite recently, and uh, I have to say I was uh, you know, very moved by it. It's not an easy read. You know, it's, it's difficult to read on many levels. Um, you very eloquently um, show the, the social, cultural, political, but also spatial moves um, and strategies that people and nations employ to live, um, to live on the ruins of other people's lives, right? I mean, that's really at the heart of settler colonialism. And these strategies refer to settler colonialism more generally but you focus on Israel. And so I would like you to sort of sum up what these main strategies are, you know, the, the ones you're illustrating, uh, you're analyzing and illustrating in your book. Um, and what is specific to Israel here? Thank you, Nadia. Um, it's good, I would want to say it's good to be here, but we're very far away at the moment. Um, so, so maybe before I start um, talking about these strategies specifically, I want to um, say something about these like um, levels or circles of, of applicability of the argument. So, so indeed, it is it 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 is a book about Israel Palestine, and it is a book about Israel Palestine as an example for settler colonialism. Though maybe later on in the conversation, we may want to probe this concept both yeah. in relation to Israel and as, as an analytical category, mm -hmm. but it is the category I'm using. Um, but, but I think that at least some of the frameworks, at least some of the arguments and some of these strategies are applicable also to other um, systematic orders of violence, especially ones that um, have to do with identity making and with place making and in mm -hmm. this sense capitalism is, is another important such um, circle of applicability. So I guess the relation between the specific and, and the broader context um, goes even further in a way from the settler colonial example. Okay. Um, but in regard to these strategies, I guess I see them as primarily effectual strategies. Um, and, and I see them as falling under three main 
um, what Raymond Williams called um, structures of feelings, what we may call um, structures of, of attachments or disattachments. Mm. And, and the very first one is, is when people find real pleasure, real enjoyment in either seeing or causing pain or harm or violence. Mm. Um, and we see it in, 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 in an array of contexts from, from lynching in the American South to when people clap, when Israeli claps, when they see Gaza being bombarded. Mm. Um, and I guess in these cases, there is no tension, there is no problem um, between identity and violence. So there is no need to develop further strategies because yeah. violence does not threaten identity, but actually goes to, to, to entrench it or to, to, to verify it in a way. Um, and there is quite a lot of literature about it, especially in regard to, to the United States in, in times and places where racial hierarchies become less stable. So this is the first set of strategies. The second is what I kind of cluster in the book around the idea of, of dissociation. So these would be strategies that are being employed in order to create some, some distance um, or separation between identity or senses of selves and the violence one either engages with or is implicated in. Um, and, and, and here, I guess, again, identity is not threatened by violence because violence is rendered through these strategies as somehow irrelevant to the identity itself. And, and in the literature, we see quite a lot of discussion in, in various such um, strategies from, from willful blindness to um, collective amnesia to um, what was Charles Mill's term, um, epistemological ignorance, strategies of disavowal and, and much more. And, and I think, and this is part of the argument of the book, that the literature is so focused on these set of strategies because there is an assumption many of us share as scholars. And this is an it's, it's an assumption that, that I think remains not just hidden, but also often unrecognized by us, that there is a tension between who most people are, or at least how they want to perceive themselves and these orders of violence. And, and this assumed tension is what called for either deploying these strategies of, of dissociation and separation, or if we think about the literature and the theories, what calls for an emphasis on this type of, of strategies in order to sustain the gap we still assume. And I think this is kind of a liberal assumption eventually, also of many critical theorists, that, that people are essentially not violent being. Now, I, I do not contest this. Um, these strategies are at play and, and I explore many of them in the book. But what I do contest, I guess, is the assumption that violence um, is, is sustainable only as long as it remains hidden or denied. Um, and, and what I want to emphasize, what I want to insist on, is that sometimes people um, are not in conflict with their violence. And, and this is where the last set of strategies arrives, which is the focus in a way of the book. Um, and here I'm thinking about the possibility that, that people develop attachments to long lasting structural or lingering violence. So, so it's not a direct pleasure in one's um, own violence or someone else's pain, like in the first set, but something more um, subtle perhaps. Um, and the book outlines um, an array of such strategies from um, architectural tendencies that have integrated renation into Israeli landscape and built environment to leisure activities that take place in, in sites of war and destruction and, and that therefore become um, sites of attachment um, or market value um, that is attached to Arab houses, which, um, and, and this is something I try to show through a very brief genealogy of what Homi Kami Baba would call um, colonial mimicking. Um, so, so how value is, is being attached to the sites of Palestinian defeat. And, and through all these um, and others, destruction, I guess, is, is integrated as an object of desire to spaces, to memories, um, to familial practices, etc. cetera. Um, and, and what I try to show in the book is the extent or the scope um, 
of subject positions that employ these um, strategies. So it's not just people in the far right, it's not that people who are explicitly racist and violent, but also very much people in the left. Um, I can talk about it much more, but maybe I want to say one small thing about context um, and, and the uniqueness of Israel. So, so what I briefly outlined here are structures, structures of attachments. And, and, and if we look at them as structures, I don't think we see much uniqueness in the Israeli case. But of course, if we look more closely um, to see those structures um, um, and, and how they take different forms in different contexts, um, then obviously we'll see the differences. So there's always this movement in the book between these wider structures and the particularities. And I guess I will say, there are many, many differences and particularities, but I guess in this context, there is just one which is maybe the most important. Um, and this is the, the, the degree of intimacy of these structures. And, and, and we see such intimate and direct um, inhabitation of destructions, I, I think in very few places. And, and by the way, most of them are not settler colonies. So again, it's, it's a call to call into question the categories. So we see them in, 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 in Cyprus or in Pakistan. Um, and, and I guess in, in Israel, there, there is um, at place a set of both temporal and spatial proximities um, that perhaps render more obviously violent this mode of, of inhabitation. And perhaps say in, in the American context, we need to do some more digging up in order to, 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 to see them and, and show them. Though I'm saying this, without saying or, or saying this is not saying um, or not creating hierarchies of dispossession or hierarchies of pain. It, it's just thinking about the phenomenology of, of different forms of, of injury and, and, and injury making. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, I think it will be important, especially for people who haven't read the book to address some of the specific empirical contexts in which you illustrate these wider points. And, um, you know, I found uh, very interesting. And also, you know, when you, you speak about this attachment to structures of violence, how in practice it plays out, uh, you know, sometimes though, you know, with, with still a kind of um, also attachment to uh, either um, being polite or, you know, uh, being um, consuming organic goods. I mean, these sort of uh, contradictions and, you know, what we associate with liberal progressiveness. And then, you know, when you dig deeper. So, and I, I want to go into that in a moment because I think that's important, you know, for our audience to understand, you know, more clearly. But before I do that, I mean, you know, as I was reading your book, I was sort of wondering, you know, as someone who also engages in research that's often, you know, quite sort of personal and it's, it's, it's hard, it's, you know, it's sort of politically sensitive. And so what did it actually mean for you to do this research? I mean, it must have been incredibly tricky, you know, for you as an Israeli, as a woman to, you know, being, um, you know, having your politics to do this research and write the book. I mean, what in the first case actually led you to write the book and, and, how did you go about researching it and, and what were some of the main ethical issues and dilemmas writing it? Um, many, many questions. So, so it was indeed, it was indeed very tricky. And it was very tricky because much of it is is very, very personal, right? It's it's a book about an identity, which is my own identity eventually. Um, that cannot escape being everything that it wants to refuse, right? These 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 people to which you refer now with the examples, these people who want to be right, leftists, good doers, consume well, and, and but, but eventually who they are, right? They cannot ex escape the violence that is very much embedded into who they are. I, I am such a person as an Israeli. Um, so, 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 so it's, it is about a torn identity and, and writing it was like digging deep yeah. into these, these tears and these wounds. Um, so, so, so it was very close to home. And, and I think precisely because of that, when I went about researching it, I distanced it from home mm -hmm. um, to make it less tricky so I can make it more intimate if, if it makes sense. So, so for example, 
One of these examples um, that, that I, I review is um, a fictive person called Irit from a movie called Sons of the Sea, um, who is a Jewish Israeli woman, leftist, um, progressive, everything, who lives in a depopulated Palestinian house. Um, and I know many such Irits. Many of my friends inhabit such places in, in Jaffa and Jerusalem. So I could have done ethnographic work. Um, mm -hmm. But in a way, I also couldn't, right? It, it was too much for me. And, and I felt as if I can do more and say more by going to the world of art and, and fiction, um, precisely because it is so real for me. Um, and, and I guess from, from a different perspective, what was tricky about it is that, that it is an effort to write a book about decolonization from the point of view of the colonizer. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, I should say that it is not a book about decolonization. Mm -hmm. It's a book about colonization. It's a yes. book about the entrenchment of the self in a position of taking space and, 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 and being accepting or becoming by this, this self who lives in, as you said before, the, the destruction of, of others. Mm. But, but, but the motivation that underlies the process of writing is trying to unsettle this identity, is trying to understand how we can undo this, um, um, this positionality as part of a project of decolonization. Um, and so I guess in this sense, it was tricky in, in two different ways. Um, first, because one could ask, why should we care? Mm. Right? Why is it for you that is for me um, as an Israeli to write a book who is eventually or eventually must be a book about decolonization. It's not for the colonizer to, to negotiate in this kind of conversation. Um, and, and I guess my answer for that would be um, dual. First, that ethically and politically, I think I still cannot give up the idea of a shared struggle. It's still important for me. Um, and also more realistically, I guess, given the very radical unevenness of powers in the current international setting, I cannot see a successful Palestinian struggle for decolonization that does not find a way to pull into its side um, a, a significant amount of, of Israelis. It, it's, I, I don't think it's going to work otherwise. And so asking this question from the point of view of the colonizer, as, as a person who is very much like immersed in, in decolonial and post-colonial literature about positionality was, was difficult and tricky, but at the same time necessary, right? Um, it, it seemed to me that we must understand how we can create this kind of movement in one's position that would allow Israelis to imagine a different future. Um, but at the same time, I guess writing a book about decolonization, given what I said or what I say in the book about identity that is very much identity whose entire being is taking place, taking the place of another, eliminate the other, expropriate the other, et cetera, which is what settler colonialism, as you said, is eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so, so writing about decolonization from, from this perspective as an Israeli was, at least to some extent, um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my own undoing. Um, and I'm thinking here with Memi's critique of, of the colonizer who refuses, but I'm also thinking here against many other people who wrote about decolonization from, from the same positionality whose, whose accounts are often somewhat either simplistic or naive, I find because they try to avoid this trickiness, because they refuse the radical undoing that needs to take place. Um, so yes, so, so, so it was difficult to write. Yeah, yeah, I can um, see that. And I have lots of questions in terms of, you know, what it did to you, but I, I think we should um, now go to some of the examples to make it, you know, make your argument more tangible. And you already mentioned Irit, and that episode and of course that is part um, you're referring to a scene of Palestinian filmmaker Anna-Marie Anna Jassier's film Salt of the Sea and by the way anyone in the audience who hasn't seen this movie I greatly greatly recommend it it's a brilliant movie so the scene you're starting or you're, you're referring to is um, Soraya 
who is a Palestinian woman from Brooklyn. She is visiting her old family home in Jaffa. And uh, th that's uh, the home that her family had to leave behind. And so uh, who opens the door? It's Irid. She's a young uh, Israeli woman, clearly sort of progressive, liberal. And she, you know, very politely and warmly invites Soraya and her friends to stay in the house, right? Um, I mean, but the situation is clearly unbearable for Soraya. Uh, and so I was wondering if you can sort of unpack that uh, for us a bit. What, what does this dynamic actually signify for you? What did you use it to illustrate more widely? Um, so I think what I wanted to understand is how, while it is indeed unbearable for Sayora, it is so bearable for Ibit. I wanted to understand the bearability because for those of you who did not see the movie, Ibit is very, peaceful about the entire situation, right? She, she, and, and this peacefulness is, is supposedly part of what makes her progressive, right? She's, she invites them in, she accepts them, she's very, very nice. But this niceness was, was very disturbing to me because, because it, it was her refusal to be undone by this moment. So, so when, when Sarah knocks on the door, she makes Irit's position as a settler inescapable. Right, it, it, it makes undeniable if it's part in, in this project of, of, of this position. And still, th this does not seem to, to emotionally affect you in, in, in any way. It does not seem to threaten her identity or security in her place. So, so my question, and, and, and in a way, this is the question of, of the book, and it takes us back to the, to the first question about strategies, was, was what make it possible, even for someone like Yuri, who is so much from the left and presumably so aware of the political situation, to be so so accepting, so undone by the colonial, so not undone, and undone by the colonial encounter. Um, so, so she does not deny the violence. She does not engage in separating it from who she is. Um, so it's not these models of, of, of denial and blindness or dissociation. Um, but she owns eventually this violence. Um, and, and by the end, she calls the police in order to kick them out when, when this surfaces. Um, so, so, so I guess at play are several things. First, I think this possibility to stay settled is the very success of the project of settler colonialism. So I wanted to understand it and understand the success. I think that once we understand this, we also need to understand differently what a critique of violence can hope to achieve <clears throat> and what forms it should take, whether we should make things more visible or whether we should engage in a different form of critique, but I'll leave it for later. Um, but but, but Evit in, in, in seeing this, this settleness, Evit does two things, I guess, for me. She, she's an example and she's an emblem. So, so she represents a concrete case, even if it's an imaginary case of Israelis who live in depopulated Palestinian houses. But we can also think of this as, as a structure um, that, that captures how the Israeli homeland is, is inhabited. Um, so this is precisely an emblem of this ability to live amidst destruction. And, and therefore, as part of, of the story, um, um, I also tell the story of, of a process, which is both the process Irit undergoes between the time she opens the door and is very accepting and peaceful until the time she calls the police to kick Sayora and her friends out. But it's also a story about Zionism that is told in this chapter in, in a quite fragmented, structured, fractured way in, in order to understand what I see as one of the most important processes in Israel in the recent years in, in which we move from an identity that is truly being undone by this knock on the door, that is that really cannot bear one's position once it becomes clear that the land is inhabited by someone else, um, to an identity that, that is being unaffected by this knowledge, to an identity at the end that actually completely accepts and even embraces, if not celebrates, um, their own position as, as a violent person. Yeah. So this is kind of what the chapter tries yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, you do that uh, really brilliantly in that chapter. And uh, 
I was also really intrigued and not only because I like cooking and cooking shows, but I was intrigued by the story you tell about an episode of MasterChef. My God, it was just so, uh, they had so many layers, right? So there is this episode of MasterChef you're referring to and candidates in this episode were asked um, to bake uh, pita bread. Uh, and aside from the fact that it's sort of constructed as this Israeli uh, <laughs> food item, you know, which of course is problematic. Uh, so, but you're, you're focusing, zooming in on the dynamics with one of the candidates, uh, uh, Yohida Nizri, and he is, uh, you know, he's a domestic family man. He has many children. He cooks and he bakes this amazing big pita bread and, you know, speaks about the pita as, you know, symbolizing Israel and, you know, you can put in so many things and then you have this delicious sandwich, right? But he is also, you know, a settler who has recently been evicted. I mean, one of the few cases of a settlement actually being closed down. And, you know, in, in this chapter, and you describe the very different attitude to his eviction and his uh, losing his home, uh, as opposed to, you know, what, of course, happens to Palestinians on, an, on a daily basis, right? Um, so, yeah, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this episode of MasterChef, Israeli MasterChef. Um, as you now, just now, put them, Ivit and Nisri in relation to each other, um, it occurred to me that we can think of very opposite relations between what has been externalized and what we want to think about selfhood. And, and with, with Nisri, it's very clear to me, like this gap, um, because Nisri is, is a settler in, in an outpost, which is an illegal settlement, even according to Israeli law. And he was one of the leaders of the struggle against this eviction. But in this show, he's like, as you said, they're like, most nice family men ever. Um, and, and, and so there is like something you referred before to like people who do good or something like that, right? So, 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 so we don't see him as a violent person, but, but obviously his entire being is, right? So there is this difference. And I'm wondering whether we can think about, and this is not something I thought of until this very moment, whether we can think about Evita as the opposite of that. Um, right, so she is someone who is very liberal and who is like a, a do-gooder and whatever. But but maybe something in her behavior, in her ex, it's not really externality, but like her place, like spatial placement in the world, is the form of violence. Though once we superimpose these together, then the questions of the in and the out, I guess loses its significance so so they eventually collapse to each other but what i'm wanting to say i guess is that nisri represents a very different subject position than irit even though they eventually share the same positions as as a settler and and part of what i wanted to show in this episode is is very straightforward and very um predictable which is that that israelis um, can see and lament and feel the pain of the eviction of other Israeli Jews from their homes, even if it is in, in a settlement, whereas they at best ignore, um, if not celebrate, the destruction of Palestinian homes and, and homeland. And right before that chapter, I bring a screenshot um, from a Facebook page of Netanyahu, who was then prime minister, in which he celebrates the destruction of, of I think it was eight Palestinian houses in, in Kalanswa. Now, Kalanswa is an Israeli-Palestinian city. So, so the people are citizens of Israel. And still, it, it was a sense of joy for him to tell everyone that these houses are being demolished as a revenge. And it, and it was very explicitly as a revenge for the destruction of the houses of, of Amuna. Um, so, so this is a very straightforward expected kind of level. But I guess through this, I wanted to show much more. So um, um, I wanted to talk about how settlements are being normalized, um, both in the Israeli public opinion, but also in informal governmental policies. Um, I think what we see in the last decade or so is that the discussion about the legitimation of the settlement has ended in Israel. It's, it's clear that they're there to stay, which is a radical change in Israel politics. Um, I wanted to show also like these very 
different levels of appropriation. So there was the pita bread, which has been, appropriate, been appropriated as an Israeli food. But eventually, there is refugeeness itself that is being appropriated. Like the, losing one's home becomes something that is not of Palestinians, but of settlers, um, which is, of course, bullshit, because as the show was being filmed, there was another settlement that was being built to um, uh, the people from from Amona. So, so maybe the houses were demolished, but but actually the the the, the right for the territory has been reasserted. And now I, I said bullshit, and immediately I want to take it back. And maybe it's an opportunity for me to address something that I skipped about ethical dilemmas in writing this book, because writing this chapter in a way was an ethical dilemma, um, because. Um, so, so it is really easy for someone like myself to simply be against misery um, um, for reason that I'm happy to elaborate on later. I think the eviction of, of, of Amona, as well as many other settlements that, that have not been evicted was necessary. Um, but at the same time, as I was writing this chapter, I did not want to reproduce the type of erasure I just criticized from the other side. Um, and, and I think it was perhaps only when I, when I watched videos of this eviction in order to write this chapter that I could see the pain and the loss that are also embedded in this destruction of homes. Um, and, and it was important for me to find a place in myself that is attentive to this pain, um, because I think without it, we lose something about our human ability to connect with each other. So I guess the, 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 the impossibility was to keep to both sides, right? What is the ethics of foregrounding this loss of a settler, of, of homes which are an act of mass land theft? But, but from the other side, how do we insist on justice when, when on the individual level, it is so clearly harmful and painful? So, so this was one thing I struggled with a lot. And, and in a way, I guess, in a more sublimed way. This is the struggle that guides the very essence or the very project, which is the book. How do we hold to, to both sides? How do we see this land as a home of both right, Israelis and Palestinians? How do we not lose either side of like this, this ethical insistence? Yeah, well, I really appreciate uh, you sharing that. I mean, I have to admit that I, it does sort of raise uh, waves of discomfort listening to the kind of uh, two sides, uh, because I mean, I think it's one thing to, um, you know, equate um, Israelis uh, in general and the sort of overall uh, recognizing settler colonialism and attachment to home and then, you know, Palestinians. And I, I mean, I understand that, but I think for me, it is quite a stretch, I have to say to think about the eviction of Palestinian homes and then the eviction of even, as you say, within the Israeli <laughs> framework, you know, illegal settlement and, and you know, the, the other settlements that are also illegal but are still thriving. I find it, you know, sort of emotionally and politically quite difficult. Uh, I understand what you're trying to do. I, I think I need to think about it a bit more. I think I probably would push back against it. Uh, but um, I uh, maybe uh, uh, we move to you know the last uh, example because that also links to this discussion. Um, and before I do that, I just want to invite everyone you know has a question or comment. I see there's one question already. Uh, please put it in the Q and A. Um, but, so, or did you but want may to? May I just back? say something yeah, about yeah, the two sides? Yeah. So the two sides is not like. And, and maybe it's a bad choice of words, right? It's not about equalizing them as yeah. two sides of a conflict. I don't yes. think about it in terms of a conflict, but in, in terms of yeah. settler colonialism, disposition, et cetera. Um, but I guess precisely because I, I share the fact that this is an, an ethical and political stretch, that, that even seeing this as something that can be seen even if momentarily as a, a problem, even though I, there, everything in my, my political yeah. beliefs think that these people should not be there. Mm -hmm. um, the, it's, it's this one 
grain of sand, right? That yeah. that I insist on nonetheless digging into precisely because it's so easy for me to ignore yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I I understand that. Um, yeah. I, I you know it it is uh, it is difficult. It's very. Um, I think it's very emotionally charged and it's difficult not to sort of react, but I, I understand um, what, what you're doing there. So I, I'm wondering though, if we can speak uh, before we are opening up to the Q and A, uh, briefly talk about Golan. Golan, who <laughs> is a famous settler. Um, he has been involved in organic chicken farming and um, you know, his story uh, illustrates a range of different issues again. And uh, so first of all, you know, the, the way that um, individuals are inflicting direct violence and harm to Palestinians, but at the same time, you know, can be this proponents of living in harmony with nature, with the land, uh, organic farming, and, you know, treating the animals with respect. And, you know, this is just, Gosh, it was, you know, very, very powerful. Um, and, you know, maybe he is an extreme case, but of course we know that, and this is not just happening in Israel, that you have this actually, you know, people who are into organic uh, farming, but, you know, cruel in other ways. And so can you tell us a bit about Golan and explain the points you were sort of trying to raise with his story? So, so Golan's name is actually everyone. Um, mm. He's uh, and he's the founder of a place called Give Otolam, which is this like organic farm. Um, but also he is the father of or the pioneer of what is um, now called the New Settlement Movement, which is basically individual that take the liberty to go and take over Palestinian land, usually in an area that the state is more reluctant to occupy because it is directly inhabited and belongs to Palestinians. Um, so the Israeli state um, engages in, in various modes of confiscating land, but this is basically land that has not yet been formally confiscated and therefore these individuals go and, and, and settle on it um, um, through usually very direct violence. Um, um, kick people off um, their homes and, and, and take possession of these homes and these territories. I, I say this, but I should also reserve this as, as I also do in the book, like this distinction between the state and the settlers actually does not exist, right? So 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 the state keeps keeps back in this movement, but but this seemingly separated positions allow right allow the state to push to things that otherwise it would be impossible to do and, and we can talk about the, the concrete mechanisms of this later above all there is like a, a a constant protection from 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 the military and infrastructures and the like that the state gives to these people um and and i chose Golan because even though or or every run because even though he's a real person um, he's also a figure in a way. He's he's a myth already, and he's a myth because of his violence. So he became known because of his unreserved direct violence that that has become like a name or symbol among Palestinians themselves. So Palestinians, when they encounter like a, a, in, in that area a very violent settler, they just call him everyone. So everyone became like this symbol of, of a form of violence that, that is very direct and unreserved. And, and I guess if, if, if I go back to the discomfort of the previous question, he, here I had none, right? Be, because here this violence was, was so direct and, and so clear that, um, um, th that there was no question, right? Um, not that there was a question, in the previous question but, but there was no, there was no sense of, of, of a human fabric, right, that, that, that can be um, um, torn away somehow. Um, and, and I guess the reason I picked him and, and what I try to do in this chapter is in a way to pull back all these other figures into the same analysis of violence. So, so including Irit and including um, um, Nisri and others, because this, practice of organic agriculture, which is presumably, again, so progressive, 
um, is often seen in, in literature that describes like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as, as a form of what we can call organic washing, right? Like, like gay washing, pink washing or green washing or whatever. So, so taking something good and, and use it in order to divert attention from the violence of occupation. So it again, takes us back to the question of strategies from the first question. Um, because, because understanding organic agriculture this way is, is precisely understanding it through the prism of dissociation and, and collective blindness, right? It's about, we look at the chicken and how great they're being raised, and so we don't look at the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do in this chapter is to, so, to show how these are inseparable, to show mm -hmm. how the organic practices are actually one of the most effective tools of this possession. And one, this is a form of violence. It, it does not hide violence. It does not push it away. It actually unleashes it in ways that could not be unleashed otherwise. So it's again about breaking this, these presumed assumptions um, between, between left and right, between progressiveness and violence, um, et cetera, that, that I think must be done when we think of, of this positionality of the settler. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I, th I think it's time to now move to the questions. Actually, we have three questions, uh, one quite long one from Adi. But let me start with Leonara Massini's question was thanking you for your research. And she is wondering if you could please expand a bit on collective amnesia as a form of violence. And uh, she's a scholar in it Italian colonial history. And she has thought about this concept of collective amnesia numerous times. So the collective amnesia of uh, Italy's colonial past. She is very interested in how you frame it in terms of violent backla backlash of the colonial violence. And I'm going to also take a second question here by Duha Mograbi, uh, who's saying the difference between discrimination and oppression is power. This is why we speak of white fragility when white people are angry for losing their privilege, often seen as white racism by white people. Do you see a parallel in something that we would call Israeli fragility? Um, I'll start with the second. Um, I see parallelism, um, and, and I think it, it is an important concept. Um, and, 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 and part of what I try to show is precisely this form of entrenchment that comes right in response to, to a threat. So if we go back to the case, to the case of Urit and Sayora, we, we, I guess we can explain it precisely through this concept. Um, it is when Soraya insists that the house is hers, even though Irit can stay, but, but we must acknowledge the fact that the house is eventually her family's. This is when Irit pushes back, right? Because this is where the fragility of the position um, um, comes into play. My, my one hesitation here is with the very um, um, almost physicality of fragility, because I think what we see is an, is, is an almost opposite material process. Um, and I keep talking about entrenchment in this regard, right? So, so, so it's, it's a consolidation, maybe more than anything else. So, so the framework, yes, the concept may be less so, I guess. Um, and in regard to, um, was it collective amnesia? Um, so, so I think it's not my argument, right? We have many others who have argued that Israelis, but also many others who have been engaging in very long lasting um, um, forms of, of oppression and dispossession, mass violence, find ways to forget not as individuals, but as nations or communities, um, um, the past atrocities. And the claim is that what, what allows them to go on and say, assume liberal progressive identities, but, but also other identities is a form of of, of, not of actively not remembering, right? Of changing narratives, um, 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 changing the way societies are organized so that people will be disconnected, right? From, from that violence. Um, and and, and, and there, there is quite a lot of writing that kind of employs this concept. And, and I guess my own contribution is actually to, to think against it, right? 
not not against it in the sense that I think it does not take place, but against it as in, in thinking against the dominance of this type of explanations. Because, because I think what happens in the settler colony, um, and, and again, specifically in Israel, because it is so dense, is that violence, both, both in its directness and, and through the traces of the past violence, is, is there all around us. Mm. We've always mm. seen it. We've always recognized it. We could not have forgotten it. So, so what we actually need to come to term with is is how this violence became so constitutive to identity and not how identity has been constantly engaged in, in forgetting this violence. I'm not sure this is what's at stake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I think that's, uh, it's, um, that's at the heart of your argument, actually pushing back against uh, that, uh, that specific um, argument that is valid in many contexts, but you know, is really problematic in the Israeli uh, context. Yeah, I think that was very clear in your book and I appreciated that. Um, Haga, there, there is a sort of question of clarification from Saida Masood. Hello, Saida. Um, she says, in Nisri's case, I wanted to clarify what you were saying. I can see that you're trying to lean in into the humanity of Nisri and, and similar settlers, but don't we need to compare the possibility of agency for Nisri and for other settlers like him with the possibility of agency for Palestinians and the current settler colonial structure in Palestine, Israel. And I also would like to take a um, question comment from uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Lina Fusetti. Hello, Lina. Uh, my issue is the use of the concept of settler colonialism, serving lands from communities without rights to lands and occupation cannot be simply settler colonialism. It is a question of sovereignty and lack of it as a severe act of violence, precisely because those who lose lands like a voice or the law to adjudicate their concerns. The occupier is there to stay, but even in the past colonial setting, the people had recourse to the law. Is that not the main issue that is missing? The Palestinian that have no access to, to right the wrongs. What is in the argument to use settler colonialism? What does it hide? Thank um, you both for your questions. Excellent questions, really. Um, let, let me start with Nisri, because I cannot but completely agree and even say more. It's not just about individual agencies of Nisri versus a Palestinian whose home has been demolished. Um, it's also about the structural um, differentiation right, that allow or preclude such agencies. Um, and, and that allow and preclude also access to law, for example, um, protection and the rest. So, 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 so there are radical differences there, um, undoubtedly. I want to get the question back, so I'm not going to um, lose anything. But um, I think I'm coming from it in a way from the opposite direction. So after completing a, a full circle, right? So, so the easy, way at it would be to say, right, Nisri is, is, is a settler um, and, and with, with everything that Nadja said, right, that, 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 that forces us to think of him as a direct object of eviction, right? Um, because his very form of being there is the act of occupation, right? Be, be, because his, his home, right, is a form of violence. And so as long as this home there Right. There is no way out of that violence. So, so this home must be removed. Um, but then eventually, I guess, I guess what I want to argue in the book is that Irit is the same, right? The, the difference between Irit and Isri is, 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 is temporal one. Um, there are differences um, in access to right, for example, between the 48 and the 67 borders. Um, and I'll get to this one, I'll get to the second question. But, but, but eventually, Irit's home is a form of violence and dispossession. So, so Irit, something happens with, with Irit as well if, if we want to arrive to an end of this solution. But as, as I said before, um, in, in response to the, to the, Irit is me as well, right? So, 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 so what would it mean 
not, not to see the humanity of Nisri and, and the pain and the loss of his loss of home as a way of justifying him staying there, but to see it as a way that calls us to rethink about it, right? To see it as a way that calls us to think about what does it mean to be a settler in, in, under all these plateaus. And, and this is why I guess it was important for me to, to, to hold to this because eventually, Right, it's it's me and my family who are a derivative of Nisri. Um, so 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 it's not about. I guess I'm I'm getting to it not in order to to justify something about where he is or what's or, or to lament the fact that Emuna was evicted. In, in not, there is no second in which I, I lament that, but but I I do this in order to question what needs to be done with all these other houses throughout Israel Palestine. Um, I hope this clarifies my, my ethical stretch. Yes. Um, and and uh, to... if you can uh, try to, um, because we, I really want to go to Adi's question as well. Um, so yeah, uh, but yeah. now Lina's uh, point, yes. So I'll just completely agree with Lina. Um, I think it hides a lot of things. One of the things it hides is the difference between 48 and 67, which is a difference also, to go back to the previous question, in the agencies of Palestinians, for example within and outside um, the boundaries of Israel. Um, and, and there are many problems with this. And, and, and I think there's many problems with this entire like literature of settler colonial studies that, that think there are like a, a set amount of cases and they're all the same. But I think why I nevertheless use this concept is it is because this category conveys this idea of taking place, of coming to stay of taking someone else's home while establishing one's own. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, and, and in the book, I, I say it in different ways. I'm not attached to this category as an analytical categories, category or as, a, or, or as a legal category, but almost like as a, as a metaphorical category that comes to talk about this establishment of homes on destruction. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now, um... Yeah, our colleague uh, Adi Ophir. Hello, Adi. Adi says, there are two opposing moves in your fascinating analysis of violence, from violence against bodies to violence against built environments and vice versa, from ruins and rubble to direct harm to bodies and souls. And how do you think about the difference between violence that targets humans and lives more generally and the violence that targets built environments and ends up in ruins. Um, how important is this distinction? And he's asking this because uh, Pima Fasio, some of the key features of violence analyzed throughout the book, especially the temporality of violence, the ability of victims to cope with it and of perpetrators to benefit from it, and the moral indignation attached to it, like a price tag, seem to differ quite significantly when the violent act targets living bodies rather than material structures. And yet in your analysis, the move from one kind of objects to another in both directions seems seamless. Thank you, Adi, for that question. Thank you, Adi. Um, so I guess I want to answer two very opposite answers to this. On the one hand, I want to insist on this difference. Um, um, Adi wrote somewhere that, that violence must be considered from the point of view of the victim. And, 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 and I want to say for a second that this victim cannot be a house, right? That the destruction of, of houses is significant only as, as, is significant as an act of violence, only as a derivative of, of, of the pain that is caused to the body or the soul or the political fabric of the victim. Now, and, and, and I think with body and soul and political fabric, we already see that the distinctions at play are not just between objects and subjects, but, but also on other levels. Um, so this is one answer, but the opposite answer would be that, that there are parts in the book in which I really want to insist on the violence that, that is captured in the ruin itself. So in the, in the materiality of the stones um, that are there in the materi materiality of the arches that are there, something about the violence is, is being carried um, through time. 
and 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 there is a whole discussion about how the ruin itself remembers the ruin itself is a form of a hangover this is how um yeah Navarre Singh puts it um that 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 basically makes through its materiality without relation to the victim or the person seeing it through its materiality it it captures violence somehow so so it's kind of I, I think I have a better answer actually um <laughs> let's think about about houses through which people are being killed so specifically Gaza so since 2009, um, the vast majority of people in Gaza have, de have died, have been killed, murdered by the ruins of their own houses. So basically Israel bombards houses and not people. And the people in the house are being, are, are, are killed. And so part of what Israel does in this practice is to insist on the separation between people and houses. So there is like this idea of knocking on the roof in which Israel um, um, uh, bombards the house in a, in a small bomb to warn the people in it to leave so that it can destroy the house without killing the people. So, so by insisting on this differentiation um, that Adi points to, Israel tries to preserve its morality and its adherence to international law because it says, Oh, we only, right, we only bombarded the house and not the people. The people had a chance to live. But, but in a place like Gaza, right, and in, in, in an allegory, maybe we can think about it much more widely about the entire space with, between the, the, the sea and the river. People cannot really live, right? People have nowhere to go. So, so these like knocking on the roof are meaningless. And, and, so, and so in some sense, I think we must also um, acknowledge the points in which these differentiations cannot be made. And I think they can be made less or they're much more blurry when we think not about destructions of houses, but destructions of homes, which already entail so much right, subjectivity in them, so much of the sense of who we are and who our family is and kinship and attachment to place. So, so, so I think there are at least, at least enclaves in which I, I want to make this, this distinction blurry, even though something much more straightforward in me wants to, to keep it clear. Yeah. Yes, um, I um, appreciate that, um, you know, blurring of boundaries. And I think that example of Gaza, I think it's, um, you know, really um, shows that uh, the, the necessity, you know, to obviously, but at the same time, also important to keep the distinction. I. Just as we're winding down, I was just sort of thinking about the sort of conclusion of your book. I mean, there's no conclusion per se, but uh, I did um, I, I did very much appreciate the ambivalence that you express, uh, you know, people reading such a book, of course, there's sort of a question. So, so what do we do with that? You know, what did you do with that? What, I guess people are asking for some kind of political, um, you know, solution. And, you know, you make it clear where well, there is no solution per se, and that you are, yourself are kind of stuck between, uh, you know, profound kind of, well, position of undoing yourself and, and, and the kind of pessimism to realize, well, that, you know, the self is constituted through violence, I mean, directly, but at the same time, still holding on to the idea, well, you know, we need a collective struggle. Uh, and I think you do that really well. Um, do you just sort of uh, now in retrospect after having published the book, uh, have, has your thinking shifted in one direction or another? Has there been sort of direction uh, reactions, you know, from uh, people like, you know, your family and friends, for example, in Israel, you know, how has that impacted you? Just quickly, because we, we actually have run out of time, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do it quickly. Okay. Um, I don't think I, I became more attached. Like I, I, I still cannot see a mm. solution. But as I read the book now before our conversation for the first time since I did the copy editing, there was a moment there that I think I want to hold on to. And it takes us back to Ivit and the, the visits of not just Soroya, but also two other Palestinian friends um, in her house. And there, there are two lines there where I say, maybe they become friends. Mm. Maybe she goes to Ramallah and meets his family and he changes something in her. Um, 
And then I said, but this is doesn't this is not what happens in the book. What happens in the book is that it goes the other direction. Mm -hmm. But but I think if there is something that is at least part of the solution, and again, I should say that it is part of the solution, the solution must rest first of all and above all on like an, a, a democratization, right? And a level institutional um, change to go back to the question of sovereignty and right. Um, and, it, and it must be based on a redistribution of, of stolen sources and resources. Um, so, so, so this is first of all and above all, but I think beyond that, right? What we need is, is a change in, in the effectual level. Um, and, and I'm not sure how this is done. Like I don't have a prescription for that, how you make people be friends with other people. Um, but, but that moment, like in the book when I read now was I guess the most optimistic two lines I've ever written. So I guess I won't hold, I want to hold on to them. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Haga, for this uh, conversation. I um, encourage you all to to read Hager's book, as I said, you know, it is not an easy read. It's uh, it's uh, difficult, it's um, emotionally and politically challenging, but it's uh, very well done, very eloquent and moving and certainly got me to think and rethink, um, you know, quite, uh, quite a lot. So um, thank you very much, Hager. Thank you, uh, all of you who uh, were tuned in today, uh, listening to us, participating, asking questions, um, those uh, few who were following us on YouTube. And I hope I will see many of you throughout the year, either online, well, I won't see you online, but you know, I, uh, in, in spirit anyway, or on campus this year, we also have some on-campus events. So thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. Thanks, Haga. Thank you. Bye-bye.